Amen. Good morning, everyone. Glad you're here this morning. It's good to see you this morning, and I hope you're happy to see me, because I'm, I'm happy to see you. It's good to see all these smiling faces here the, this morning. So, does everyone uh, have a bulletin? If not, you may want to raise your hand, and we'll get you a bulletin. There's an outline of today's sermon, scripture in the back if you want to follow along. I just want to start the, the sermon by telling you um, a, a story. Uh, it's a true story, as a matter of fact. Once upon a time, there's a little boy that the other children called Sparky after a comic strip horse named Sparkplug. Any of you remember that? Yeah? Okay. Even though the boy hated the name, he he never could could shake it. School was difficult for Sparky. He failed every subject in the eighth grade. He flunked physics in high school. In fact, he still holds the school record for being the worst physics student. (laughs) Okay. He also flunked Latin, algebra, and English, and he didn't do much better in sports. He made the school golf team, but his poor playing cost the team their championship. Throughout his youth, Sparky was, was a loser socially. Uh, he wasn't actively disliked, just people just ignored him. Uh, he was astonished when a classmate would even say, say hi to him, and he would, he would never ask a girl out on a date for fear of, of being rejected. But Sparky didn't let being a loser uh, uh, bother him. He, he did the, the, the best that he could. He did, however, have a hobby that he loved. He loved to draw cartoons, but no one else thought they were any good. When he was a senior in high school, he submitted some of his scar, uh, cartoons to the school yearbook, but they rejected his cartoons. And he, he wasn't surprised. That's what happens to a loser. Well, then he, he submitted his cartoons. He want, his dream job was to work at Walt Disney, and his dream job uh, uh, was to be a cartoonist there. So they said, okay, well, send us some of your work. And he did, and he got a letter back saying, there's no work for you here. <laughs> but again, he, he wasn't surprised. It's just the life of a loser, right? Uh, he, in, in a weird way, he thought his life was kind of funny, and he started to tell of his own life in his cartoons, He was a little boy loser, an underachiever whose kite would never fly. You know who I'm getting at, don't you? All right, this this comic character came to be known to the whole world as Charlie Brown. That's right. The boy who was a loser, who failed eighth grade, who who was rejected by Disney and and his yearbook, his cartoons, uh, was Charles Monroe or Sparky Schultz. Uh, He was the creator of the Penis comic strip, and he was a Christian, and he passed away. Uh, some years ago. But we've all experienced rejection in our lifetime, haven't we? Maybe not to the degree Sparky did, but we've all had to to experience rejection, some failure. But we can't give up. We have to to take the adversities in our lives and and look at them as opportunities, opportunities for for God to to work in our lives in, in a mighty way. I heard it said one time that when you're going through a difficult time, don't waste the pain. There's so much wisdom in that. Don't waste the pain. In other words, you're going through that that situation, and you're learning through it, and you're going to come out through it better. So don't waste that pain and use it to to maybe help others, or or, uh, it'll help you uh, confirm your faith or strengthen your faith. I once heard it said, it's not what happens to you in life that matters, but what you do with it, that matters. Amen. You see, not everyone in this life can be a winner. That, that's just how it is. But you know what? In Christ, we're all winners. That's right. We're, we're all winners in, in the end. Today, I want to look at a character in the Bible. I, I talked about him a little bit last week. But I want to look at a character in the Bible because I think by all worldly standards, this individual was a loser. He was a loser. Uh, So if you would, turn to uh, Mark chapter 10, verse 46, page 1542 in your Bible. And I'm not calling him a loser. I'm saying by the world standards, he was a loser. Okay? So let's read the story. Mark chapter 10, verse 46. We're going to look at blind Bartimaeus. Like I said, we touched on him just a little bit last week. How are we doing? Are you there? 
Then they came to Jericho as Jesus and his disciples together with a large crowd were leaving the city. A blind man, Bartimaeus, that is the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, Call him. So they called to the blind man, Cheer up on your feet, he's calling you. Throwing back, throwing his cloak aside, he, he jumped to his feet and he came to Jesus. Jesus asked, what, what do you want me to do for you? The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, Lord, oh Lord, this is the day that you have made. Let us be glad and, and rejoice in it. And Father, I'm, I'm aware of the fact that even though we're sitting here this morning all dressed up, looking good, smiles on our faces, that there's many here today who, who deep inside have hurt and pain in their lives, are facing discouragement and troubling times. Oh, that's why it's so good to come into your house, to sing praises to you, to be with other believers, to be encouraged, to, to, to hear your word. And I pray that you would use your word this morning to encourage us, to lift us up, to lift our eyes away from the circumstances and, and onto you. So, Father, bless this time. Draw us near to you as we seek to, to just uh, obey what you call us to do. So, Father, into your hands I commit this sermon. May you use me and, and speak through me this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So, if we look at Bartimaeus' life, could we agree that he had little going for him? Would that be a fair statement? He, here he was, he was blind. He was a beggar, right? Uh, he was poor. That, he had no money, just on the side of the road. He had no skill or talent. He just had to make his living a blind beggar on the side of the road. That, 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 was, that was his life. That existed of his whole life. However, when he encountered Jesus, his whole life changed, didn't it? You know, he knew Jesus was his only hope, that Jesus could transform him. So he, he cried out to Jesus to have mercy on him. He cried out to Jesus to claim his victory in Jesus Christ, hence the title of this sermon, that we all have to cry out to Jesus for our victory. You know, I believe too many of us as, as Christians, we're, we're merely surviving in this life. We're just, we're just surviving. I read an interesting uh, illustration the other day. This may shock you, okay? But did you know that the WWF, the World Wrestling, do you know that's fake? <laughs> I, I'm, I, I, I do not lie. I, I don't mean to catch you off guard about that. But they decide beforehand, the two wrestling opponents, they decide beforehand who's going to win. So, so when they go out into the, into the arena to wrestle, the winner is not fighting for victory. He's fighting from a point of victory. He already knows he's going to win, you see? And understand, Christians, we're fighting from victory. We're not fighting for victory. We're, we already know we're going to win. But too, too many Christians, I believe, were going through this world just merely surviving. You understand who you are in Christ and all that you have in, in Christ. And I believe we need to claim that victory. And we need to call out to Jesus as Bartimaeus did. So I want to look at some things that we can learn from Bartimaeus. I want to look at three ways we can claim our victory. Number one, you need to capitalize on the opportunities that God provides for you. Capitalize on the opportunities that God provides for you. <clears throat> In the passage I just read, Jesus and his disciples, they were, they were leaving town. And I, as I'm reading it, I'm thinking, okay, 
somewhere along the line, Bartimaeus heard about Jesus. He, he heard about his healing powers. And it's interesting that he gave him a, a messianic title. Uh, we don't know why he, he did that. And I'll, I'll elaborate on that in just a, just a minute. But he gave Jesus a messianic title, uh, that he is the Messiah. Uh, he said, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. He, he called out to God. Why? Because he saw his opportunity slipping away because Jesus was getting ready to leave town. If you, if you read that passage, right? So he thinks, man, this is my only hope. This is my only hope. Jesus is leaving. Here I am. There's crowds of people all around him, and he's a beggar sitting on the side of the road getting no attention. And what are his chances of, of Jesus even recognizing him? Jesus even talking to him. So he yells out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And all the people around him said, be quiet, hush. But it says he shouted all the louder, right? He called out to God. He reached out to God. And I, I believe that this is you and me. We're like that blind beggar on the side of the road. Because the Bible says that we're blinded by sin. That the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers so they cannot see. 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. And a lot of people are blinded by sin. So what do you do when you're blinded by sin? What's the only way you can be saved? It's just to call out to Jesus. That's all you can do. Like this blind beggar on the side of the road, that's all he could do. And you understand something? That our condition, apart from Christ, we're like that blind beggar. And all we could do is call out to Jesus. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And understand this, there may be voices telling you, shut up. Shut up. Don't you dare call out to Jesus. You're not worthy to, to call out to Jesus. But you shout all the louder. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. That's how we claim our, our victory in Jesus Christ. And as I said, it's, even though Bartimaeus used a messianic title for Jesus, I seriously doubt he knew Jesus was the Messiah. Why do I say that? Well, what did he ask for? Did he ask for forgiveness? No. Did he ask for salvation, to be with him in heaven in glory? What did he ask for? Sight. Jesus said, what do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? Wow, imagine having Jesus' utmost attention. Imagine Jesus just came to you today, right? Walking down the road. You call out to Jesus, and he says, what do you want me to do for you? Wow. Right? What do you want me? What would you say? <laughs> what would you want me to do for you? Understand something. Jesus is saying that to you today. When you call out to him today, the crowds may be telling you to hush, be quiet. But Jesus is saying, what do you want me to do for you today? Now, let me ask you this. Don't you think Jesus knew the man was blind? Yeah. So why did Jesus ask him that? Don't you think it was obvious? Right? I think Jesus wanted him to know if he knew what he wanted. Because not everybody wants to get healed. Right? Not everybody wants to get healed. But what did he ask for Jesus? Now, he, he could have forgiveness of sins. He could have eternal life in heaven. But he asked for sight. If you think about it, what a trivial thing to ask for, isn't it? When he could have had so much more... He's asking for sight. He could have had so much more. And I think we're like that too. Because Jesus is asking you today, what do you want me to do for you? I want more money. <laughs> I want a better job. I want a car that won't break down on me. And these aren't bad things to ask for. But I think we miss an opportunity sometimes when Jesus asks, what do you want me to do for you? Especially if you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior. And all you're asking for Jesus is just temporary things. Things of this world. When he wants to give you eternal riches, he wants to give you so much more. So we can, we can learn from Bartimaeus, can't we? Absolutely, absolutely. 
You know, opportunities only become opportunities when we seize them for the right reason. Right? You know, there, there are some things that, that you just can't get back. A spoken word, a spent arrow, time that has passed, and a missed opportunity. You know, and an opportunity could come by today for you. And you could seize it, but you seize it for the wrong reasons. And when you seize it for the wrong reasons, it's almost as if you might as well have missed the, the opportunity. Right? So, I, I think the best opportunity or example I could think of is, imagine if Mozart walked in here today. I know, play with me, Okay. Let's say he walked in here today, and we say, Mozart, can you play chopsticks? <laughs> Wouldn't that be silly to ask him for something so, so trivial when he, when, he, when he could do so much more? And I think about some of the things we ask for God. Uh, uh, he wants to give us so much more. But we ask him for these, these silly things sometimes, these little things. Ephesians 3.20. Somebody read to me Ephesians 3.20. Please. This might be a good passage for you to memorize. Put it on your refrigerator. Put it on your mirror. I don't care where. Memorize it. Keep this passage in front of you. Stand up, please. Who's ever going to read it? Stand up. Now to him who is able to do more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations. I don't want you to miss that part. God is able to do exceedingly abundantly more than you can ever ask or imagine. And some people usually stop there. But what comes after that, Scott? Right before that. Ah, the power that works within us. So how is God going to do exceedingly abundantly more than you can ever ask or imagine? He's going to do it through you through the power that works within us, through the Holy Spirit, as we're walking in step with the Holy Spirit. You know, Jesus, when he walked the face of this earth, he said, I can only do what I see my Father doing. He couldn't do anything contrary to, to God's will. So when we ask for things, we need to pray like Jesus would pray and only ask for those things according to, to God's will. So Jesus is asking you this morning, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? I don't want to discourage you from asking for worldly things. Don't think that by any means. I said that because there are some here today who don't even know Jesus as Lord and Savior. And they're blinded by, by sin. And they're asking for worldly things when they need eternal things. When they need eternal riches. So I don't know where you're at spiritually today. But I, I, I do want to encourage you. Like, like they, after Jesus said, tell them to come here, what did they say to him? You remember? Cheer up on your feet. He's calling you. Right? That's my word to you today. Cheer up on your feet. He's calling you. He's calling you to him today. What do you want me to do for you, he says. He's calling you. Think about that. Will you please? Will you please? You want to be free from sin? You want salvation? Do you want to walk with Jesus? Or do you just want a new car or, or money? You know, we may miss an opportunity today, and I pray that, that we don't. But understand something, this is not the only opportunity God wants you to receive Jesus Christ. But it may be your last opportunity to receive it. Because we don't know what tomorrow holds, do we? 2 Peter 3.9 says, He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Maybe some of you here today need to call out to Jesus, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. And I want to assure you something. Just as Jesus took time out of his busy schedule, everything that was going on, the crowds around him, Jesus took time and said, what do you want? What do you want me to do for you? Jesus is not too busy for you. If you call out to him, he will say, what do you want me to do? He will have compassion on you. 
I don't know about you, but that's, that's encouraging. Very, very encouraging to me. C.S. Lewis told of a time when Satan held a, a, a strategy session from stopping someone who was close to receiving Jesus Christ. And Satan asked, you know, what, what shall we do? And one demon said, I know. We can tell people there is no life after death, that they die like animals. And Satan said, no, that will not work. People aren't that ignorant. Even atheists at times admit they sense there will be life beyond the grave. Another demon said, let's, let's say there's no God, and if there ever was one, that he's dead now. Satan said, oh, that won't work either. Most of them know that there's a God, even if they won't admit it. Finally, one demon said, I have it, a sure solution. Let's tell them God is real, Jesus is the Son of God, and frees us from our sins. And all the other demons were shocked. <gasps> How dare you say that? And then he added this. Then we will tell them that now is not the best time to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And we'll help them make excuses. We'll tell them there's no hurry. There's no hurry. And the demons danced in delight because they knew their plan would work. What voice are you listening today? Because Satan will whisper in your ear, you don't need Jesus. You don't need to do it today. You can wait till tomorrow. But what does God's word say? Today is the day of salvation. Today. This is an opportunity that you may have today that may not come tomorrow. And it's not because of Jesus not offering you the opportunity, but you may not be here tomorrow. We don't know. What are you going to ask for Jesus today? He's asking you, what do you want me to do for you? And I pray that if you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, that you will just cry out to him, Lord, have mercy on me. Lord, have mercy on me. We're going to have a time of invitation at the end of this sermon. Not right now, but I'm giving you a heads up. And that's a time for you to respond to the message. And if, if, if you want to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, if you're not certain how, then you come forward at, at the end of this, this sermon. All right? All right. You know, what, what do you have to lose? What do you have to lose? Eternal damnation, separation from God, spiritual blindness, friends who really don't care about you anyhow, or suffering and a sinful lifestyle. You know, I've never met one person who regretted turning to Jesus. But I've met a lot of people who have regretted not turning to Jesus. I was 32 years old before I received Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And I envy people. I hear, man, I, I started preaching when I was 17. I think, wow, boy, if I could do my life over again. Wow. I wasted so many years. I've never heard anyone regret becoming a Christian. Never. We just regret that we didn't do it sooner. You know, but God can make up for the years that the locusts have, have eaten. But you have to capitalize on the opportunities that God gives you. If you don't capitalize on the opportunities, then he can't make up for the years that the locusts have eaten. Let's look at number two. I've already touched on this, so I might go through this fairly quickly. Ignore the negative voices around you. Ignore, ignore the negative voices around you. Look at verse 48. The crowd's reaction when Bartimaeus cried for help. Many rebuked him and told him, be quiet. Right? And it says in verse 48, he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. He knew victory was within his grasp, and he was not going to let anyone or anything get in his way. He shouted all the louder, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. I want to just quickly go over some other people who didn't listen to the negative voices in their life. He was called a slow learner. He was retarded. He was labeled retarded, and he was written off as unable to learn anything. And you have Albert Einstein. He was also labeled too stupid to learn, and you have Thomas Edison. He was raised in poverty and was very ugly, and you have Abraham Lincoln. In fact, there's a humorous story with Abraham Lincoln. In fact, Lincoln once told his friend how he came into this uh, possession of a, of a really expensive knife. 
And he said, one day a fellow approached me and said, excuse me, sir, I have something that belongs to you. How is that? Lincoln asked. The man said, this knife was once given to me with the condition that I keep it until I find someone homelier looking than me. <laughs> okay. And the man said, I have carried this knife for years, but I think you are now entitled to it under the same conditions. And it is rumored Lincoln was buried with that knife. He, okay. He couldn't find anyone homelier. So what did Lincoln and Edison and Einstein and Schultz and Bartimaeus, what did they all have in common? They didn't give up. They didn't give up. They didn't listen to the negative voices around them, and, and they persevered and claimed their victory, their God-given purpose for which they, they were created. You see, you're always going to have your critics. You can have the best idea, and you'll share it with someone, and psst, right? For some reason, some people don't like to see you get ahead. They don't like to see you succeed. They may act like it. So don't worry about pleasing your critics because you know why? You never will. You never will. You only need to be worried about pleasing one, and that's God. That, that's all you need to be worried about. You don't need to worry about pleasing anybody else besides your wife. Okay. But, no, God and your wife, right. But, but don't, don't, let, don't let others discourage you from what God has called you to do. And, and let me ask you this. Who defines you or what, what defines you? You know, I, I grew up in a, in a family where, man, I was just put down. I had a low self-esteem. Uh, if it left up to my family, I would have never accomplished anything. Really, I was the baby boy, and they just, by the time they got to me, after five boys, yeah, psh, do what you want, you know, it's just, you know. Uh, and I, I let my, my family define me for a while, and I let the world define me for a while, and I was stupid and fat and ugly, never amount to anything. And then I joined the Army at 17, quit high school, joined the Army. And that was the best thing that ever happened. And I, I excelled in the Army. You know why? I got certificates of achievement. Wow. For this guy, that was something I've never experienced in my life, where I got accolades, where I got rewarded for something. I just got put down one thing after another in my family. Put down. I tried to do something good, and I got put down. But in the Army, I got rewarded. So I, I did 20 years in the Army. I loved the Army. I excelled in the Army. Um, and I defined myself by the Army. And then I became a Christian. And then I began to see myself a lot differently. Now I define myself by the Word of God. Amen. This is how I, I define myself. This is how uh, I look at Jeff Roman through God's eyes. How does God see me? You see, the world may say you're ugly. The world may say you're stupid, you're a loser, you're worthless. And we can falsely conclude these things about ourselves because that's what we've been told our, our whole lives. And, and I believe we're constantly in danger of letting the world define who we are. We have to let the Word of God define who we are. So I don't have time to get into this, but I will... Write, uh, I'll write it down for anyone that wants it. I'm just going to go through it fast. And these, this is not even everything. But who does God say you are in Christ? Number one, you're a child of God. Don't write it down. You're not going to have time. I'll just go over it. I can email it to you or what, whatever. Uh, number one, you're, you're a child of God. Number two, you're justified and redeemed. Number three, you're a saint. Did you know that? That you're in the Bible, you're, you're, you're uh, Saint Scott, uh, uh, Saint, who else we got here? Saint George, Saint Link, right? The, no, it was funny one time. Um, I can't think of his name right now, but he had a he had a prayer group, and he, he was saying this in in the prayer group. It was a pastor who told this story, and he says, "I want you to find a person's name next to you, and you you tell that person, uh, uh, you know, say your name with with a saint." He said, "Well, I'm 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 Saint Jeff," and I'm you know. So went around, and then this one guy was quiet. And he said, why aren't you saying anything? He said, well, my name's Bernard. <laughs> okay, Bernard, you don't want to, okay. <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> you're a new creation in Christ. You're the righteousness of God. You're redeemed and forgiven. You're sealed with the Holy Spirit. You're a citizen of heaven. You're seated in the heavenly places. You are victorious in Christ. Do you understand who you are now in God's eyes? You're no longer a blind beggar, a loser on the side of the road. Do you understand? You're a child of God, sealed with the Holy Spirit. God wants to work great and mighty things in and through your life, exceedingly, abundantly, more than you can ever ask or imagine. That's who you are in Christ. Don't let the world define who you are. Because the world will put you down. The negative voices will put you down. You can't listen to them. you got to listen to the Word of God and who the Word of God says you are. Amen? Amen. You see, the ones telling blind Bartimaeus to be quiet, they didn't think he was worthy of receiving what Jesus had to, had to give him. But Jesus stopped and said, call, call him over. You know, Jesus is stopping today. He's coming to you, and he's saying, come. Come, what, what do you want me to do for you today? What do you want me to do for you today? What are you going to ask for? What are you going to ask for? Father, Lord, I just think about Lion Bartimaeus' life, Lord. If he had listened to the people around him, he would be a blind beggar the rest of his life. He would have been alone and lost the rest of his life. And Father, if there's someone here today who needs to call out to you today, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. Father, may they know beyond a doubt that, that you will come to them. And they have to publicly profess their faith in you, just as, just as Bartimaeus had to do. That he had to publicly profess, I want to be healed. I, I want to receive sight. So, Lord, just as you call blind Bartimaeus to publicly profess his faith in you, you're calling, you're calling us here today to publicly profess our faith in you. That we, we want to receive heavenly sight. We want to receive the eyes of Jesus. We want to have the mind of Christ. Oh, Lord, we want to see you. We want to experience the power of the resurrection at work in our lives. We want to claim our, our victory today in Jesus Christ. Father, we know that all things are possible through you. So we, we seize the opportunity this morning. Father, into your hands I commit this time. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to stand and we're going to.